Thank you. So, uh, I'd like to once again uh, thank the organizers for uh, doing such a, a, a great job. Uh, first of all, for having such a nice location, and <laughs> but also for all the hard work and uh, organizing a conference that I think is going very well. Um, yes, yeah, so this is uh, the, what I'm going to talk about is um, kind of snippets out of these articles. Um, well, I won't go into details about what comes from where. So, <coughs> let me go to something that everyone's familiar with, which is um, conformal compactification. So, <coughs> um, so what it, what, will it mean, what it will mean in this lecture, at least, is um, I'm going to say a pseudo Riemannian manifold which is the original physical or geometric manifold uh, with a metric G plus, is, is conformally compact if there's a manifold with boundary that I'm calling um, M overline there, uh, such that, <coughs> there's, first of all, there's a metric um, on the manifold with boundary, and the metric goes all the way to the boundary. So it's a, just a, a metric on the manifold with boundary. And such that <coughs> on the interior, um, the, this metric is conformally related to the original geometric or physical metric um, <coughs> in a way that means that the original metric cannot go to the boundary. So, so this smooth metric G bar, you multiply by R to the minus 2, where R is a defining function for the boundary. So <coughs> what that means is that the boundary is, is the zero locus of, of this function, and also that the derivative of the function is not zero along the boundary. So that's what I mean by defining function. So obviously this metric blows up um, at the boundary and the boundary's at infinity according to, for instance, geodesics on the inside and so on. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> so, so I'm, I'm going to keep this picture around. Of course, the picture may look very different from that. So um, <coughs> don't, don't read too much into the picture. Pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is just something local around the boundary anyway. Um, but let's have some picture in mind. <coughs> okay, so what do you get with this? So um, <coughs> the, what you get is canonically a conformal structure on the boundary. Why is that? <coughs> well, we think of the original metric G plus as the actual geometric data, not the, not the choice of defining functions. So we can change our mind about the defining function for the boundary. Um, <coughs> for each choice of defining function, we have this G bar, and G bar induces a metric on the boundary, just the usual induced metric on a hypersurface. Um, <clears throat> but if we change our mind about this defining function, what we're allowed to do is multiply it by a positive function. So if you multiply R by a positive function, then that conformally rescales the G bar. And so <clears throat> you get a different metric on the boundary, induced on the boundary, that's conformally related to the previous one. So what you get canonically is just a conformal structure on the boundary. And <clears throat> one of the... So one of the big games in, in this is to, is to link um, the conformal theory of the boundary to, to uh, pseudo-Romanian geometry or field theory on the, in, on the interior. So in the ADF-CFT correspondence, they, they even want to relate conformal field theory on the boundary to, to um, string theory on, on the bulk. Um, but in GR, you might simply be interested in relating the conformal geometry or field theory on the boundary to field theory on the in interior or geometry on the interior. Um, <coughs> so as a sort of refinement, um, at least in the case of, of Romanian signature, when the interior is, is, is Einstein, and in the case of Romanian signature, that means negative Einstein, um, <coughs> for this to work, then, then this is uh, often called a Poincaré-Einstein uh, manifold. And in fact, you know, I'll, I'll be a bit loose, and <coughs> even if it's not, if we're in other signatures and we have a situation like this, I might call it Poincaré Einstein anyway if it's Einstein on the interior. Okay, but anyway, so conformal compactification has been important in lots of areas, um, <coughs> including scattering and so on. So there's lo lots of people here who are, who, are, who are much more expert on these things than I am, so I won't try and go into that. But <coughs> um, what I do want to do is, is, is try and understand this picture. Um, geometrically, uh, in, well, you might think it's a fairly simple picture anyway, so what is there to do? So, well, we'll see what there is to do. Um, but the idea is, is both to, first of all, understand this um, in, a, in a slightly different way, which can help solve these sort of problems. Um, and then, on the other hand, it also tells us how it fits into a, a larger picture that, that you can then generalize in a sort of systematic way. Okay, so... <coughs> okay, well, the model... So one should go back to the model. 
um, if you want to do, do something like understand something or generalize, at least that's my opinion. So <coughs> uh, the model for conformal compactification is just the Poincare model for hyperbolic space. So, so how does that work? Well, <coughs> you, in, you embed hyperbolic space as an open ball in Euclidean space in a way where the metric, the hyperbolic metric, is just conformally related to the Euclidean metric. So here's the Euclidean metric, and here's this. Um, in fact, <coughs> basically, well, four times the Euclidean metric, and then there's your r to the minus two factor. So it's really a conformal compactification, or yeah, in, in the sense that I was talking about on the previous slide. Um, <coughs> and what you get then is uh, the boundary is a sphere, um, and there are some groups around. So <coughs> um, it's well known, and we'll see why in a minute, that this group, <coughs> SON plus 1, 1, so <coughs> then in a sense the conformal group for for Sn uh, acts on the interior, and it also acts on the boundary. So it acts by isometries on the interior, but it acts conformally on the boundary. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's the model of that conformal compactification. If we want to think about possibly generalizing it, it's useful to notice that there's another uh, com compactification of hyperbolic space that you're all familiar with, which is namely the Klein model. So <coughs> In the Klein model, uh, you also put hyperbolic space uh, as an open ball in, in uh, Euclidean space, but this time in a different way, whereas this uh, circle meeting the boundary orthogonally is meant to represent a geodesic over here, uh, when you do it in the Klein model, you do it so that geodesics are still represented by straight lines. So these are <coughs> geodesics for the hyperbolic uh, metric are also geodesics for Euclidean space, except there's a change of parameterization. So that means that it's related to projective geometry, which is sort of the geometry of geodesics up to parameterization. Okay, but notice that you still have the same groups around. I um, mean, in fact, the, <coughs> the, the sphere at infinity in both cases has a conformal structure. The same group <coughs> uh, acts on the interior, of course, because it acted over here, and the interior is diffeomorphic. Um, so you might think, well, the, these are essentially the same picture. So, <coughs> so maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, actually, what we'll see is that there's an interesting difference in the way the boundary is attached um, at infinity, and that's sort of important. Now, a, a hint at that difference can be seen if you look at, at a different uh, problem, namely that of, of compactifying just flat Euclidean space. So, so here we were compactifying a space which had negative curvature, so what about if you want to compactify just Euclidean space? So, so here's the Euclidean plane. Um, <coughs> and of course, uh, as you all know, the way to do this is, is to just sit a sphere on the plane and do stereographic projections. So you take this point in the North Pole, you identify a point on the sphere with the line through the North Pole and that point as to the point where it lands on Euclidean space. So this is a one-point compactification. There's some groups around again, so the Euclidean group acts on the plane, so it acts on the sphere minus the North Pole, and it also acts on the North Pole, but it just fixes it. So the group acts trivially there. So what about if you want to do that using projective geometry? Well, again, you probably know you use central projection. So <coughs> the um, projective compactification of Euclidean space uh, ends up quite different. So now the boundary is, is again, a sphere <coughs> uh, of one lower dimension. Um, and now the group, Euclidean group, uh, doesn't act trivially on the boundary. The, the translation part of the Euclidean group acts trivially, but the uh, rotation bit acts on the boundary. Okay, so in some sense what we want to do is understand the curved versions of these pictures. Now, <coughs> I said there was a difference between these two in terms of the way the boundary is attached. Um, because <coughs> if there's going to be a difference, it more or less has to be that, because you have the same group acting on the interior, it acts conformally on the boundaries and so on, so there has to be something a little bit subtle going on. So let's look first of all at the conformal case, and <coughs> sort of uh, here's a do-it-yourself kit for making the conformal compactification of, of uh, hyperbolic space, but <coughs> in a way that, that attaches the boundary, okay, so that you know geometrically how the boundary is attached. <coughs> Okay, so how does it start? This is actually in two colors, um, so you have to have very good color sense to detect it. So there's black <laughs> and blue, right? So <coughs> sort of bruising colors. Um, so, so let's start off in the black, but up here we're just making the conformal sphere first. So 
<coughs> just by convention, I want my boundary to have dimension n, so, that, so, the, so the bulk space is going to have dimension n plus 1. So I'm going to start off in Rn plus 3 with its standard coordinates and equipped with this Lorentzian metric. Okay, so this is <coughs> going to make a Riemannian signature conformal structure. Okay, so because I have this Lorentzian signature metric, I get a, a null cone of, uh, of, of, of null vectors in Rn plus 3, of course. <coughs> and, um, <coughs> and uh, of course, there's a, there's a group turning up because I have this metric here, so, so we get this uh, pseudo-Euclidean group, and I actually want to pick, just, just for fun, the time-oriented part of that so I can just look at this forward cone and see the group acting on the forward cone. Okay, so now <coughs> what happens, I can ray projectivize that forward cone. So, so each ray generating the cone just becomes a point. So, so when we do that, we get a sphere. Um, <coughs> uh, so, well, topologically a sphere. And <coughs> what I want to point out first is this sphere has a conformal structure. So if you take a section of that ray projectivization, so that'll literally be a, a section of this cone, then it's easy to see that that section determines a metric on the sphere by just pulling back this um, inner product up here thought of as a metric in Rn, Rn plus 3. <coughs> okay, so, so each, each section of the projectivization gives you a metric on the sphere. <coughs> on the other hand, um, in, in the black part of the picture, there is no preferred section, so... So what happens if you change your mind about the section? Well, if you change your mind and pick a different section, you get a conformally related uh, metric on the sphere. So what you get for free or canonically is a conformal structure on the sphere. <coughs> okay, so, so in the black part, we have the, the construction of the conformal sphere. So this is the flat model of conformal geometry. It's the ray projectivization of the future null cone in that sense. <coughs> and we have the, this group. Um, this SO n plus 2, 1 group, the orthochronous part of that acting on that. <coughs> so we can think of the sphere as a homogeneous space, which is that semi-simple Lie group modulo what's actually a parabolic subgroup, namely the stabilizer within, <coughs> within that group of a null ray. Okay, so that's the conformal bit. There's no hyperbolic geometry yet. But <coughs> so what you do is you uh, introduce a hyperbolic section. So... <laughs> So, or conic section, rather. So what, I, what, what you can do in this picture is simply break this uh, symmetry of this group by picking a space-like vector. And here's a sort of obvious choice, right? So, <coughs> and then that space-like vector determines a linear polynomial. So it's homogeneous degree one. And we can look at where that linear polynomial is zero. That determines a subcone of the cone. And we can look at where that linear polynomial is one. So I should say that that was this sigma equals one section that I've drawn here. Okay, so, <coughs> okay, so what do we say? Well, this, so, okay, first of all, this subcone, just by all the arguments that we had a conformal sphere, this must be a, a conformal sphere of one lower dimension. So here it is, <coughs> conformal structure on that of one lower dimension. On the other hand, um, on this side of that section, this, <coughs> of that subcone rather, this, uh, where this polynomial is one, then that is a section over the ray projectivization. So that determines a metric on this hemisphere, and it's easy to check that that metric is hyperbolic. Okay? So that gives the hyperbolic metric, and it's easy to verify that this actually is the conformal infinity, that it's a com uh, conformal compactification in the usual sense. <coughs> so this is a nice uh, picture of how that arises, and I want you to think of that <coughs> as arising as a sort of symmetry reduction by one of these <coughs> constant vectors, okay, a space-like vector in that case. Okay, so <coughs> okay, so we, now we want to think of a curved version of this, and I'm going to be brief <coughs> uh, here, partly because that's what I was talking about um, in the last weeks, and also because I want to get onto this projector version. Okay, so <coughs> so the moral from uh, the previous slide was that <coughs> the uh, conformal compactification of hyperbolic space arises by the symmetry breaking by a space-like uh, vector of some sort. Now, there's a curved version of that because a conformal geometry determines a... a just as a Riemannian geometry or a pseudo-Riemannian geometry determines canonically a levi civita connection, conformal geometry determines canonically a Cartan connection 
or, or equivalently a tractor connection. <clears throat> so the tractor connection being the associated connection that's equivalent to the Cartan connection. And this tractor connection doesn't live on the tangent bundle, it lives on a, a slight extension of that by, two, uh, by going up rank, increasing the rank by two. So, so this tractor bundle has rank dimension of the manifold plus two. And there's a, an invariant, conformally invariant connection on it. Okay, so <coughs> in that picture, what this constant vector gets replaced by is a parallel section of that bundle. So you have a canonical conformal bundle, conformal uh, connection on a vector bundle, and a parallel section of that is, is essentially an Einstein metric on your underlying manifold. Okay? And the word essentially meaning that <coughs> there may be points where there are conformal infinities. So, so <coughs> this, this parallel section uh, may have a certain component, the leading component of it, which you can project off canonically, that has a zero locus. And when that happens, it gives you the conformal infinity of your structure. So, <coughs> so there's a very general way to understand, uh, in a sense, how the Poincaré-Einstein manifold arises. So, so and here it is summarized um, as a kind of theorem. It's really a definition, if you like. Um, a Poincaré manifold is a conformal structure with boundary, and it has a parallel tractor on it that, in this case, is space-like. That, that's not so important, but that, it's the, but that this length is non-zero is important. Um, and the, and the, the boundary has to be the zero set of a certain uh, sort of distinguished component of this parallel thing. So the, the tractor bundle has a, a distinguished projection because it's not an irreducible bundle. And, and <coughs> it projects out a density of conformal weight one. And so, so the zero locus of that um, you want to coincide with your boundary. <coughs> so if you have that, you have a Poincaré-Einstein manifold, and conversely, um, the usual definition of Poincaré-Einstein manifold can be reinterpreted this way. OK, so that's the conformal picture. We now want to develop a similar, um, a similar picture for the, for the projective case, because then we'll, we'll know how to generalize it. <coughs> Okay, so we, we want to start with the equivalent picture for the model. So remember, we had the Klein model. We drew a, a, what looked like a disk, but it was meant to be a low-dimensional representation of a ball with its boundary. Um, and on the interior, we had hyperbolic space. <coughs> so, so how do we understand that from one of these higher-dimensional pictures? <coughs> okay, so well, we start off very similarly. So last time we had Rn plus 3. This, this time we start with Rn plus 2. So we're down a dimension. I'm writing XA for standard coordinates again. And I'm supposing that this is equipped with its standard volume form. OK? So this is all blue stuff mainly, meaning there's nothing there yet, because this is black. Um, so, so we have Rn plus 2. And basically, we have the group SLn plus 2 acting. That's what we have so far. OK, now projectivize it again. Ray, projectivize Rn plus 2. What do you get? Well, you get a sphere again. OK? So, so <coughs> here it is, um, of, of, of projectivized Rn plus 2. And SLn plus 2 acts on that because it acted on Rn plus 2. So this is, <coughs> this is um, now the, 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 the model for flat projective geometry. So why is this the model for flat projective geometry? Well, this, this sphere that you get this way has distinguished uh, curves in it, which come from taking two planes through the origin and taking their projectivization. So they give you a distinguished family of curves on this sphere that you think of as, as the model for flat projective geometry. <coughs> OK, so flat projective geometry is the sphere acted on by SLN plus 2. And um, the isotropy group of a point, so we can think of it explicitly as a homogeneous space, is again a parabolic subgroup. So it's a parabolic subgroup now on SLN plus 2. And it's again just a stabilizer of a ray, right? So you pick your favorite ray. That determines, stabilizing that determines a subgroup of SLN plus 2. Um, <coughs> and that obviously is the same as stabilizing a point on the sphere. OK, so that's projective geometry. And now we want to have the reduction so that we see the Klein Einstein turn up. <coughs> OK, so this time, instead of taking a vector in Rn plus 2, I'm going to do my symmetry reduction by introducing the metric. So, <coughs> so the slightly subtle thing is here now the metric's in blue, not black, right? So, so this is an additional structure, um, whereas the metric was part of getting the conformal sphere, 
Now this is an additional structure that we're putting in the projective case. So again, <coughs> um, once we introduce this, we get a reduction of groups. So this group uh, has a symmetry reduction down to this uh, SON plus 1, 1. So the group preserving this this uh, matrix, so the isotropy group of this under, under the action of the group. And um, we're going to call this group G again. So, um, and the, and the, the sphere which is acted on by SLN plus 2, if you restrict to this smaller group, decomposes in, um, into orbits. Okay, so you have open orbits um, like the two polar caps uh, and this section in here, and closed orbits, which are hypersurfaces in there. Okay, but there's more structure than you see by looking at the orbits here, namely there are the orbits back up on Rn plus 2. So, <coughs> for instance, um, in this case, instead of getting a linear polynomial, we get this quadratic polynomial, which you, you have by, by just contracting the standard coordinates into the metric. Okay, so this is homogeneous of degree 2, and the orbits um, are parameterized by level sets for that as, as level sets for that polynomial. So, so here's the, the minus one level set um, here and here, and that, they give us uh, hyperboloids. So that's a hyperboloid of two sheets. We get a hyperboloid of one sheet and, and a null cone and so on. So, okay, so the null cone is descending to these closed orbits on the sphere, and so these closed orbits have a conformal structure for the same reason we had a conformal structure before. Okay, because this, this really is like the picture before. But these other bits, like these hyperboloids, are now uh, are sections over the ray projectivization, and they determine metrics on the open orbits. Okay, so we get the hyperbolic metric up here, um, <coughs> we get a, a de Sitter metric here actually, and so on, the hyperbolic metric. So now if you take this open orbit plus its boundary, that is the Klein model of, of um, up to a slight distortion. That's just the projective compactification of hyperbolic space, which um, <coughs> up to a minor diffeomorphism is the usual Klein model. Okay, so, so this is a nice way of recovering the Klein model, I, I claim, um, because from here we, we can see how to generalize it quite nicely. <coughs> okay, so we want to make a curved version of that picture. So, so um, let, let's set about making sort of conceptually making a curved version of that picture. So the first step in, in curving up the picture is to say what we mean by a projective structure in the curve setting. So what it is, probably many of you know, if not all, it's an equivalence class of connections where affine connections, and they'll be torsion-free, um, I'll take them as affine, so torsion-free affine connections, and they're, the equivalence relation is that they have the same geodesics up to parameterization. So moving from one to the other, you have the same geodesic, the traces are the same, but the parameterization of geodesics change. <clears throat> okay, so to write that sort of more analytically, we can say that these connections, the equivalence relation is that they're related like this, where epsilon is any one form, okay? So this is the connection actually as a connection on one form, so, so the difference looks like that. <clears throat> so there's a dual version. <clears throat> and this is, this is the, the change that you're allowed so that the connections determine the same geodesics. Okay, well, I want you to internalize this idea um, and, and this shorthand notation. So <coughs> for projectively related connections, I'll write a shorthand like that to mean they're related by the one form that shows up here. <coughs> okay, so a projective structure is just an equivalence class of connections in that way that have the same geodesics. <coughs> okay, but there's another way of understanding it due to Eli Cartan. Um, and it starts off actually with the way Klein would have done it. <laughs> so over here is Klein's picture. So, <clears throat> so Klein would, would look at the picture on the previous slide and say that <clears throat> um, you should think of the projective sphere as SLN plus 2 mod this parabolic subgroup. Okay? And then if you do that, you have a principal bundle over that, namely the, the group SL2 itself, and it has fiber this parabolic subgroup. So that's the Klein model. So we see it explicitly as a homogeneous space. Now, the Cartan uh, picture is, is a curved version of this. So <coughs> what you ask is that um, your manifold has a principal bundle over it, which has the same fiber as the model. So this is going to be a Cartan geometry modeled on this homogeneous picture. <coughs> and whereas um, the, you had the Mora-Cartan connection here, uh, sorry, 
Murakatan form here, which is just the thing that identifies the tangent space with left invariant vector fields. Um, <coughs> the, over here, you have a thing called a Cartan connection. So it's a, it's a, <coughs> a Li G, where G is, in this case, the Li algebra of SL2, um, <coughs> N plus 2, rather. Um, so it, it, uh, it's a one form that totally parallelize, parallelizes this principal bundle that takes values in that same Li algebra that the Murakatan connection does. But it has weaker equivariance properties. That's all I want to say, because you don't need to understand the details. So there's some sort of connection on this that looks a lot like the Murakatan form, and it has just weaker equivariance properties. And this is the idea of a Cartan connection. And <clears throat> for a huge class of structures, namely these so-called parabolic geometries, you, you get a canonical one. And in particular, for projective geometry, there is a canonical such Cartan connection. OK, so that's, in the first instance, how we want to think of projective geometry in this way. <clears throat> now, for calculations, uh, it's easier to work with these associated bundles, the tractor bundles. So when you have a Cartan connection, you can get bundles, uh, vector bundles with linear connections that are equivalent to the, to the original Cartan connection. <coughs> Unlike with a principal connection, the main difference is that <coughs> if, if, if we had a principal connection on this bundle, then any representation of P would be all right here and we would get a linear connection. For, for, for the case of a Cartan connection, you need this representation to be a representation of the big group, which was SLN plus 2 in our case, then thought of as a representation of this parabolic by restriction. <coughs> it's not sufficient to take a representation of, of just the parabolic. Okay? So in particular, we had the defining representation for SLN plus 2, so we will get such a connection on this associated bundle. And that's called the standard tractor bundle. And actually, you can construct this connection directly very easily. So this is a sort of easy place to start. <clears throat> now, these bundles are not irreducible. For instance, the dual to this bundle, which is the one I want to have at hand, um, has, for instance, this uh, filtration structure, or this, this short exact sequence, which explains its composition. So it consists, in a sense, of an extension of the cotangent bundle by a density bundle. So the tractor bundle for projective geometry has rank the dimension of the manifold plus 1. OK, these are projective densities similar to conformal densities. So they're, again, a, a root of the canonical bundle. Or in, in this case, I've taken the highest exterior power of the tangent bundle instead. So I can have all positive numbers. And this root defines what that bundle means. In fact, the cotangent bundle here is just the one jet bundle of this density bundle if you're a, if you're a person who knows about jets. <laughs> so there's, there's no choices in constructing it. OK, so, so one can now generalize that, um, that Klein picture by defining a Klein-Einstein manifold, just as there's Poincaré-Einstein manifolds, to be a projective manifold equipped with some sort of parallel tractor. So in this case, <coughs> instead of it being a parallel standard tractor, of course, we make it to be a, a parallel metric on the tractor bundle, because the, the tractor bundle for projective geometries does not have a metric usually. So if you ask it to have a metric, that's a, that, a parallel metric, then that's a holonomy reduction. right? So what we take is a projective structure, and we insist that its canonical tractor bundle has a parallel metric. <clears throat> OK, so this, this actually forces you to have an Einstein metric in the downstairs picture almost everywhere. Um, <clears throat> and then um, if we want to make this Klein-Einstein, we insist that the boundary um, is, is the zero set for something that looks a lot like that quadratic polynomial that we had in the model. <clears throat> so what is x here? In the model, it was, it was standard coordinates on Rn plus 3. But here, x is this um, canonical projector that projects from the tractor bundle to, to, to the densities. So you feed this thing. You think of it as a tra uh, co-tractor, sorry, as a tractor itself of weight 1. And you feed it into the metric, and that gives you a density of weight 2. OK, so, <clears throat> so you ask the boundary be the zero locus for that. And it, I mean, that's a, a sensible thing to do, as I will explain. <clears throat> OK, now here, I really want this to be a metric. So we need h to be non-degenerate. So for instance, um, <clears throat> if the underlying manifold had uh, <clears throat> uh, dimension n plus 1, and we had this to be signature n plus 1, 1, then <clears throat> we could get one of these Klein-Einstein things with a, with a Riemannian metric on the uh, open set. So, so I want you to sort of picture again something like that. 
Well, it's going to come up on the next slide. So, and we have a, this parallel uh, tractor on the whole thing. Okay, so, <coughs> well, I can't explain all the details of how this works, but let me, the, the, how you get the metric, the Einstein metric is very easy, so let me explain that. So here's <coughs> our manifold with boundary. Um, this is where the zero locus of that uh, density is going to be. <coughs> and overall, we have this parallel tractor. Okay, so suppose it has signature uh, cube, uh, PQ plus 1, um, <coughs> then um, this is equivalent to a negative Einstein metric uh, downstairs on your manifold where this, where this density is negative. Okay, and the way you see that is <coughs> where this density of negative, it, it splits this one jet sequence. So it splits the tractor bundle or the co-tractor bundle. <coughs> and, and, and once this is split, it actually determines, or in, in, in fact, splitting this jet thing, determines an affine connection from the projective class. So remember, you didn't have one, but once you split the sequence, you do. You have a preferred uh, connection. And in that scale, in terms of that connection, this parallel tractor takes this form. So it has the density um, in that corner, and it has the Scouten tensor times the density here and zeros off. So it's in a block diagonal form. The Scouten tensor is just the Ricci divided by the dimension for, this, for our purposes. So just think of it as Ricci. Okay, so it takes that form, but this is also parallel for the tractor connection. And when it's written in this form, you can see that that implies that the Scouten tensor is actually parallel for, for the connection that it's the Scouten tensor of, right? <coughs> so so um, on the other hand, this is a torsion-free connection, and this was assumed to be non-degenerate, so the Scouten tensor has to be non-degenerate. So now we have a torsion-free connection preserving a, a symmetric <laughs> non-degenerate um, two tensors. So, so this is obviously the levi sevita connection for that thing. And by construction, since that was its Ricci, um, it's now Einstein. Okay, so the, so the metric, uh, getting an Einstein metric is essentially for free. Um, what's not so obvious is why the zero locus of this um, density should be some nice hypersurface that you can take as a boundary. Right? So, so this is part of a, well, this, you can see this directly, but this is part of a, a very general picture that I wanted, wanted to mention. So. <coughs> Which is namely this holonomy reduction business. So <coughs> this is concerned with, so you have some semi-simple lead group <coughs> and, and say a parabolic subgroup. So <coughs> um, as in what we've been talking about. So, so you have some sort of homogeneous space. It mightn't be a sphere, but who cares? <coughs> and then um, we want to think of some symmetry reduction of this um, homogeneous space. So imagine that there's some, some sort of uh, thing that we had, like the, the tractor metric or whatever it is, that, that we, we, we look for the subgroup of this that preserves that. So we get <coughs> an isotropy group for this, for this object. So we get somehow get a subgroup, and then this will decompose into um, different strata, which are the orbits under GH of this homogeneous space. Well, there's a very general theory which says that if you start off with a Cartan geometry modeled on G mod P, <coughs> so this is one of these Cartan geometries, so conformal geometry, projective geometry, CR geometry, whatever. So, <coughs> um, and you you <coughs> equip this with a holonomy reduction. <coughs> so I won't explain completely what that means, but um, suffice to say there's some parallel tractor, effectively, for, for our purposes. So there's a parallel tractor <coughs> which looks at a point um, like the object that you were preserving over here. Okay, so, so then <coughs> your Cartan geometry, which is some manifold, <coughs> then canonically decomposes into strata. And the theorem says that the strata at, in a neighborhood of any point <coughs> have, to, have to look like on the model. In other words, there's a diffeomorphism taking <coughs> a locally rounded point which takes the curve space to the model in such a way that it maps the strata here to the strata there. Okay, it's not geometry preserving in the strict sense because this is curved and that is sort of flat but it does take um, the strata diffeomorphically to the strata. And what's more, the types of geometry here, you get a Cartan geometry induced on the different parts, and the type of Cartan geometry you get has to be the same. 
<coughs> okay, so that's enough to, to say that <coughs> in this case where we did this projective reduction, the zero locus of that um, density has to be a, a smooth embedded submanifold because that's what happens on the model. But you can, you can also be much more explicit. Um, but it's just uh, time consuming. <laughs> okay, so that's all about holonomy reductions. So we haven't got to projective compactification. So now the idea is that this suggests, though, a way to, to generalize um, these things. Because rather than take the very rigid structure, well, the not so rigid structure, but a little bit rigid, where you have a, um, a Cartan geometry with a parallel object, we want a weaker notion which just captures some of those features, namely something like the compactification that corresponds to it. <clears throat> okay, so we want to define projective compactification. So think now of um, having a manifold with boundary. So we'll have <coughs> M bar will be the manifold with boundary, and this will be the interior plus the boundary. Okay, <coughs> and on the interior, we're going to have an affine connection. And I want to talk about what it means for the affine connection to be projectively compact. So this is an analog of conformally compact. So, <coughs> um, so it turns out that, it, it, that it's natural to bring in a real parameter. So it's some, some positive number, alpha. And then <coughs> what we ask is that we say that this connection is projectively compact if there's another affine connection which, which extends to the boundary, so a connection on the whole manifold, which is related to the original one, projectively, remember that shorthand, where the one form epsilon is given in this way, so it's d rho over alpha rho, where rho is a defining density, a defining function for the boundary. Okay, so, <coughs> so this connection goes to the boundary, so obviously this connection doesn't, because it's related by this one form that blows up. And <coughs> in the interior where they're both defined, these things are projectively related. Okay, so, <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so what does this alpha mean? Well, um, a hint uh, as to what it means, if you look at the case, which was the one we're interested in anyway, where this connection, this affine connection, preserves some volume form on the manifold, then this alpha tells you how fast the volume blows up uh, for the connection nabla. So, and the reason is that, <coughs> remember, if we assume this connection preserves a volume form, there it is, grad volume equals zero, then this transformation <coughs> exactly means that um, this barred volume form is parallel for the new connection that goes to the boundary if, if they're related in this way. So therefore, this one extends to the boundary, and that, that means that tells you that the volume growth of this, this one in terms of a volume form that goes to the boundary. So you can see that this volume blows up as you go to the boundary, and the smaller alpha is, the faster it blows up. So that's what, what, what this parameter alpha is. <clears throat> okay, so um, just some other little uh, anecdotes on that. The, um, if alpha is less than or equal to 2, then the boundary is at infinity according to the geodesics. So <coughs> it's kind of, uh, it's sort of, sort of geodesically complete in that sense. So, um, <coughs> so the... Um, so, in fact, our interest then is, is in these alphas where the boundary um, is at infinity, so this, the smaller alphas. Okay, well, it's most interesting to see what this has to do with metrics, not just affine connections. Um, so, so, the first thing is to define it. So, what we will see a metric is projectively compact if, of any signature, if, if its levy severity connection is projectively compact in that sense. Okay? <coughs> then, well, that, that's just a sort of definition not so easy to use in practice, so we want to see how this looks for an actual metric or find a, a sort of normal form for projectively compact metrics. <coughs> okay, so here's, here's the theorem on that <coughs> as we have it so far. So, um, <coughs> first of all, a, a sufficient condition is, is not hard to give. So, so for alpha in this range, which is, which is the, the range which is sort of where it will, the connection on the interior will be complete, so the metric will be complete, um, in that sense, <coughs> um, and for two over alpha being an integer, then <coughs> the metric on the manifold, so the metric on the bulk, uh, is projectively compact if when you form this thing, right, so, so what are we doing? We're taking this power of the defining uh, function for the boundary times the metric minus, <coughs> um, you know, the d of the symmetric 
uh, product of, of d of the defining function over this and so on. So you ask that this, for some constant not zero, um, <coughs> extends smoothly to the boundary first of all, but there the restriction of this h has to give you a metric on the boundary. Okay, so it's non-degenerate in the boundary directions. <coughs> okay, so if this holds, then you can show that, that the metric is projectively compact of, of order alpha. So, so this has this nice property with respect to geodesics. So, <coughs> um, so I mean, that, that of course is the idea of projective compactness. It's, it's a notion of compactness where geodesics are going to behave well um, as you go to the boundary. Now, <coughs> so that's a sufficient condition. If alpha equals 2, and this is a relatively new result, we have a, now a converse of that. So, so if a metric is projectively compact of order 2, meaning its levi sevative connection is projectively compact of order 2, then it, you're necessarily um, in this form with the constant. In fact, in the sufficient direction, you don't really need this to be constant, it, it can, but it needs to be sort of asymptotically constant, but um, I'm just simplifying it for the talk. Okay, so, well, in one direction, this is sort of straightforward. So if you write the metric down um, <coughs> and you want to check that, that it's projectively compact, it basically boils down to taking the Cazal formula for the levi sevita connection and then showing directly um, there's actually, you know, a bit to do in there, but you can show directly that, <coughs> that then this uh, projectively related connection in this way that we insist on for this projective compactness extends smoothly to the boundary. Okay, so that's a sort of obvious direction. I'm going to talk about the proof just briefly in the other direction in a minute, um, but before I do that, just re-expressing that thing above, so we had this here, so written in this way it probably looks a bit unfamiliar. But when we write it like that, you'll see that this is a sort of form of a metric that you've, you've maybe seen before. So um, there's some interesting points to make. So when alpha equals 2, having uh, a metric in this form is independent of the defining function. So you can change your mind about the defining function and absorb the changes into what you mean by h. Okay, so, so that means that when alpha equals 2, you get a conformal structure on the boundary because, because you can change your mind about the defining function and that changes h conformally. When alpha is not 2, and we're looking in the range 0 to, so that means less than 2, <coughs> you can absorb this constant um, into the, the meaning of rho, but then actually the defining uh, function is determined up to order rho squared, and so things are much more rigid. You actually get a metric on the boundary, so you, you don't get a conformal boundary, you get a metric on the boundary. Um, and then just to point out that this, the, these class of projectively compact metrics have shown up uh, in the literature. So alpha equals 1 and c equals 1. Um, this appears in, the, in, for instance, Melrose's little book on, on scattering, the Stanford lectures, um, as, as, a, as a good metric for uh, generalizing Euclidean scattering is the setting, <laughs> the way he put it there. Um, <coughs> and then for alpha equals 2 and c equals 1, this is mentioned in Pfeffman Graham. It's actually um, a projectively compact metric that's equivalent to their Pfeffman Graham ambient metric, basically. So, so the ambient metric of Pfeffman Graham is really most closely related to projective geometry, and, and that's, that's where that one shows up. Okay, so now to talk a little bit about the other direction, which is much more complicated. I won't talk about it in great detail. <coughs> but suppose you have a projectively compact metric of alpha equals 2. So remember, the, this means that the levi sevita connection um, <coughs> is, is projectively compact in that sense we defined, um, then you want to show that you get a metric of this form. So how do you do that? So rho here is a defining, dense, a defining function for the boundary. Well, <coughs> you want to do a step like you would do in, in setting up Fermi coordinates. So you want to sort of fire off geodesics orthogonal to the boundary and so on. <coughs> but the problem is we don't have a metric along the boundary. So you're initially, <laughs> you're initially stuck. Um, so, <coughs> nevertheless, that's sort of the idea. So we define a vector field along the boundary to be uh, what we call a strict geodesic, geodetic transversal. If, if the vector field is, is geodesic for this connection that goes to the boundary and, um, <coughs> and is kind of dd rho, <laughs> we haven't picked coordinates yet, but this is the invariant way of saying it. So, so d rho uh, acting on the vector field uh, is 1 in a neighborhood of the boundary. <coughs> okay, well... It's easy to see you can do one of these things, but to do both of them, you have to solve some ODE, or family of ODEs, and you see that you can do that. <coughs> and when you do that, <coughs> you find out that this 
the uh, projection of the metric then to be constant along the integral curves of that vector field. Okay, so, <coughs> um, so, so once, you, once you notice that, you, you can pick product coordinates, so you call T to be this defining density rho, and then coordinates on the boundary in the obvious way, <coughs> and then what this says is that this T squared GDT um, is, is just a function of the boundary coordinates, okay? It doesn't depend on t. So that gives you some equations to control things. And then you play back in some forwards with this uh, projective compactness um, condition, and you get more and more equations on Christoffel components. And you show in a sequence first that the c of x is actually constant almost everywhere. <laughs> um, <coughs> in Romanian signature, it has to be uh, a non-zero constant simply because, because this length has to be non-zero on the interior and it's constant up the, the rays. <laughs> in other signatures, you have to be more careful. But you show that that's constant almost everywhere. And then where that's not zero, um, you can easily show that, well, not easily, but you can eventually show that these um, t, t times these components are smoothed up to the boundary and then the volume growth kind of finishes the job off. And the only thing is that when the signature um, it's quite hard to show actually that the CX was smooth on the boundary originally and, and, to, f and to finish it off and show that it's really constant um, <coughs> we use that the, the inverse of the metric satisfies a overdetermined PDE that you can prolong and then extend to the boundary as a parallel object and then that, <coughs> that contains the information of C and you end up concluding that C is smooth on the boundary and since it's <laughs> mainly constant it's constant everywhere well locally constant the boundary may have more than one component Okay, so, <coughs> so that's how you, you end up showing that form. Um, <coughs> in the final part of the talk, I want to talk about um, <coughs> something else, which is um, <coughs> how, the, how the geometry of the interior determines the compactification. So I mentioned some slightly similar things in the conformal setting. So this is about uh, similar results that hold in projective compactification. So... <coughs> um, so suppose now that, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, before, I was telling you what I'm going to do on the next slide. So before I do that, <laughs> so just to say what happens with the asymptotics, I forgot, should have looked at what I had up. Okay, so if you have a metric like that, which means it's the metrics projectively compact of order two, then there are some nice things you can say about the asymptotics. Um, so <coughs> first of all, um, this means that the scalar curvature um, has to smoothly extend to the boundary. And, and takes this value there with C in it. So basically what that's telling you is that this constant C is linked to the scalar curvature. So it's not, it's not free when alpha equals 2. You can't just set it to 1 if you're thinking of the inside as being uh, given and so on. <coughs> uh, then, um, then what you can show that this tensor here, which is a combination of the Ricci tensor and, and a constant times the metric, uh, smoothly extends to the boundary. So what, <coughs> what's the um, importance of that? Well, the metric doesn't extend smoothly to the boundary. Remember, it blows up, and, and different parts of it blow up at different rates. So what that's saying is that this <coughs> Ricci tense is doing the same thing. So this is a kind of asymptotic Einstein condition. So, so this is saying that <coughs> the, the, um, the leading part of the, of the, the, the Ricci tense is uh, um, blowing up at the boundary, if you like, is exactly the same as the leading part of the, of the metric. So, so, so these things are asymptotically Einstein in that sense. <coughs> um, <coughs> and and the, the curvature itself has this behavior. So it become, it's the leading order is it's becoming rank one at the boundary, uh, and then a term like this. So these compare with these results in conformal compactification where um, <coughs> with a minor restriction on the boundary, the conformally compact things are asymptotically hyperbolic. So this is the sort of analogous thing, which, which is an, a bit analogous, but also different. So you have this asymptotic Einstein result. Um, so the, the key idea in the proof here is actually also interesting, because um, <coughs> when alpha equals 2, so if you have this projectively compact thing, then this section here, which is, uh, involves the Scouten tensor, uh, plus some um, symmetric product of d rho uh, extends smoothly to the boundary, so that's one thing. But there it agrees with this um, second fundamental form you get there. When you have a projective structure and you have a hypersurface in a projective structure, of course, there's no way to define the second fundamental form in the usual way. 
but it turns out that you get a kind of conformal or projective second fundamental form. So you get a density valued object which is there canonically. Um, and that's, <coughs> when, when this is projectively compact, that has to be, roughly speaking, in agreement with the Skarton tensor from the interior in this sense. And this is, this is before you introduce metrics, so this is just for uh, projectively compact affine connections. But when you have a metric like this, you can also show that this quantity um, has the same boundary limit. And this is just uh, quite an involved calculation, but, but um, sort of nicely delicate. So, so, so nice coincidences happen and so on, and, and things work out that it agrees. So, so <coughs> the, this result is sort of quite surprising and nice. Okay, so that was the asymptotics, and now I'll go to the bit I was advertising before. So here, what I want to assume now is um, that it's like this picture on the board here. I have a, <coughs> a manifold with boundary, and the interior just has an affine connection that agrees <coughs> with the restriction of the projective structure to the interior, um, but where this connection doesn't extend to the, any neighborhood of a boundary point. For instance, this connection's complete or something like that, right? So... Um, so if this connection on the interior um, is special, meaning it just preserves the volume form, in fact, a volume density would do, so, so it's nothing to do with orientability, um, <coughs> then, and, and it's Ricci flat, so it's sort of an affine connection, but sort of Einstein in that sense, um, then what can you say? So I haven't assumed this is projectively compact, that's part of the punchline, then <coughs> a certain root of the volume form <coughs> extends by zero, extends smoothly by zero to a defining density for the boundary, and then the connection is forced to be projectively compact of order alpha equals one. So this is sort of showing that <coughs> in a fairly natural situation, this uh, alpha equals one projective compactness is forced. So if you have a, you just have this affine connection on the interior that's reachy flat, basically. <coughs> um, but, and, and this, this connection on the interior agrees with the projective structure that goes to the boundary. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> so okay, the, the proof here is, is quite interesting, uh, really, I think. So, so the, the Ricci flat condition <coughs> can be captured by a second order equation that's projectively invariant. So you work in the scale um, of the Ricci flat connection, then, then the density is preserved by the uh, levy of the corresponding affine connection. So you just add zero, but once you've written it like this, this is projectively invariant, so we can rewrite this in terms of a connection that goes to the boundary. Okay, so the Ricci flat condition is now captured in terms of this equation that makes sense to the boundary. And what's more, this, if you prolong this uh, overdetermined second order equation, this is exactly the equation for parallel transport of a projective tractor. So this is exactly saying that you, you have one of these actually co-tractors, you have a parallel co-tractor on your projective manifold. Okay, so you have a parallel tractor on the interior of this projective manifold with boundary, and so you can extend it parallelly to the boundary. <coughs> okay, and when you um, <coughs> extend it to the boundary, um, so first of all, the, this density has to vanish at the boundary, because because it's the scale, and if it didn't vanish at the boundary, it would mean that, that your affine connection on the interior extended to the boundary, but, it, but we assumed it didn't. Okay, so if this was uh, complete or whatever, then it has to be that the sigma vanishes at the boundary. But the whole tractor can't vanish because it's parallel and it wasn't zero on the inside. So on the boundary where sigma vanishes, the derivative of sigma is not zero. So this is a defining density for the boundary. And then once you, once you know that it's, uh, it, it's a density of weight one and it's a defining density for the boundary, it's easy to show that you have that projective compactification uh, that was in the definition. And it's easy to show in this case uh, that this boundary is totally geodesic. It's actually because that second fundamental form I mentioned, this, this density value projective second fundamental form has to vanish. And, and now from what I said before, you can, you can see why that would be true because because it has to agree with this um, Skelton tensor, which we're assuming is zero um, on the inside. So, so you get a totally geodesic boundary in this case. Um, <coughs> so what this shows you is that the, the Ricci flat condition forces a curved analog of that central projective compactification that we had uh, 
for the, um, of the, you know, we started off with the Euclidean plane, but now just think of it as the affine plane, so you can, you can compactify that by central projection, and this is, this is proving that, 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 that there's a nice curved analog of that. So, so whenever it's Ricci flat on the inside, you have to have a similar sort of result. Okay, so that's Ricci flat. Uh, <coughs> what about metrics that are uh, Einstein on the inside? So, so let's have the Ricci curvature being minus or plus n times the metric. It doesn't matter, just some constant times the metric with the constants not zero. Those are sort of standard normalizations. <coughs> and the sign because of the signature and so on. Um, then, um, then what you can show, and, and what we want is that the levi sevita connection now sits in a projective structure that extends to the boundary. Okay, so in the most minimal sense, the projective structure of the levi sevita connection extends to the boundary. Then you see that you can prove that the structure has to be projectively compact of order alpha equals 2 in the way we defined the projective compactness. And what's more, there's a parallel tractor <coughs> on, the, um, on, the, on the structure um, <coughs> and, and that we're back to this holonomy reduction picture that we, we started with before. So you, if, you, if you have this uh, Ricci uh, Einstein condition on the interior and your levi sevita connection fix, fits in the projective structure, then you're automatically back in this holonomy reduction picture. So <coughs> where you have a, a projective structure with a parallel tractor metric. Okay, well the proof, um, I won't say too much here because it's very similar to the previous case. So, so now this Ricci condition like that just means that the, the Ricci tense is parallel for the levi sevita connection <coughs> um, or the Scouten tense is parallel. And now you can interpret it in terms of a third order projectively invariant equation. And prolonging that gives you this tractor metric and then the argument is kind of similar to the previous case. <coughs> I want to just finish on um, the case of Ricci flat metrics, which I think is, which is a really nice coming together of everything, because, um, <coughs> so, so well, now we want to have uh, a projective structure as before on your manifold with boundary, and the interior, let's say we have a complete um, Ricci flat metric of some signature, and we want its levi sevita connection to be in the projective structure. <coughs> so what happens? Well, then necessarily G is projectively compact of order one, um, and the, the, um, it, the projective structure on the, you get an induced projective structure on the boundary, so this, this gets its own projective structure, but with a holonomy reduction to the group um, SOPQ. So, so the boundary inher it itself inherits one of these Klein-Einstein structures, so the boundary will have a metric almost everywhere and will have parts of it where there's only a conformal structure. And these parts, which are only a conformal structure, are the endpoints of null geodesics from the inside. So there's a very nice geometric picture of that. I can't explain all of that. <coughs> okay, so the, the proof of this is now very easy because um, the, we already talked about affine connections that were Ricci flat, and, and we saw that they give you um, projectively compact of order one and a totally geodesic boundary and so on. <coughs> um, and these conditions, like being totally geodesic on the boundary, uh, and you get a little bit more than that, mean that the, the, the Cartan connection of the boundary is compatible with the Cartan connection of the interior, which helps you link these things. <coughs> um, and then the next part of it is that the fact that this is not just any old affine connection, but, but a levi sevita connection, means that the inverse metric gives you a solution of yet another uh, overdetermined PDE, <coughs> all of these are what are called first BGG equations. And um, <coughs> th this sort of overdetermined PDE, when you prolong it, you get what looks like an inverse metric on your tractor bundle. So this is parallel, um, and, but it's contravariant like that. And when you write it in the scale of the, of the metric, it just looks like this. So it has zeros down here, but in this big block here, you have the inverse of the metric times uh, the scale to the minus two, the scale that this determines this projective density determined by the metric. It's a sort of root of the volume uh, density. So, <coughs> so this thing is parallel, so it extends to the boundary, um, and you can see that on the inside, it's, it's exactly orthogonal to this other parallel tractor that we had because we had this um, uh, alpha equals one projective compactification for the connection. So we have two parallel objects, the standard co-tractor, which was in, in before, and now this object, and they're orthogonal. 
Um, and when you get to the boundary, that exactly means that uh, this thing, when it gets to the boundary, can be interpreted as a boundary tractor, and it's non-degenerate there. That's why this parallel object on the boundary gives you this holonomy reduction for the boundary structure um, <coughs> with, with a lot of geometric content. Okay, so what this now means is that the, um, if you take pseudo-Euclidean space, like Minkowski space or whatever, then, <coughs> or curved versions thereof, then the, uh, if it's Ricci flat, then the projective compactification is going to be exactly this sort of holonomy picture. So you have a parallel object like this in the standard tractor and a um, holonomy reduction on the boundary, which means that, as I say, you'll get a metric almost everywhere. Um, oh, sorry, you'll get a metric on the boundary um, <coughs> from this uh, holonomy reduction. Okay, so, um, yeah, and, and perhaps the, the main thing to say there is that the, the projective compactification is very different from the conformal one. So, whereas in the conformal compactification, and I don't need to <laughs> say because it's been mentioned so much, the... Um, for instance, space like infinity is a point in the conformal compactification of Minkowski space, whereas um, in this uh, projective compactification, um, it's, it's, it's an open set on the boundary. So you have this, um, this is the last thing I'll draw. <coughs> so remember, we had that picture at the start, and we did a central projection. So if, <coughs> if that was time running here, then you get the, the null infinities are uh, closed, <coughs> closed curved orbits on the boundaries, and the future time-like infinity is an open set on the boundary, and the space-like infinities are open set on the boundary, uh, as is past time-like infinity. So whereas uh, you know, time-like time <coughs> infinity is a, a point in, in the conformal compactification and so on. So you get a very different sort of topology for those for those orbits <coughs> in the case of projective compactification, which I think should be useful, uh, especially in this Ricci flat case. But um, yeah, okay, I'll stop.